I recently had the privilege of speaking with former South Carolina 16th Circuit Solicitor and current Speaker Pro Tem of the South Carolina House of Representatives, Tommy Pope. Pope rose to national prominence for the prosecution of Susan Smith in 1995 for the drowning death of her two young sons, a case that captivated the nation's attention. And now, as Susan Smith becomes eligible for parole, Tommy joined me to share his insights and reflections on this pivotal moment. I mean, it has been almost 30 years since the Susan yeah. Smith trial. Yeah. And, you know, it was when she went to trial, I was a, I believe. Blame in daddy's eye. <laughs> I would know I was a junior in high school, um, but it was one that I followed. But, you know, as you know, as 30 years passed, uh, you know, I have two kids now and it, the whole, you know, it gives you a whole new perspective on, on the crime and, yeah. and just it makes you think more about, you know, what actually happened and with the parole hearing upcoming, um, you know, just, I'm looking back at this and looking back at, you know, the crime, the investigation, the trial as a whole. And it, you know, it was fascinating. So I'm, ex I'm really excited to talk to you about this as, you know, the solicitor who led that prosecution. And I mean, you were, you were young then, you were 30. Yeah. Yeah. I was 30 when I got elected. So let's see, I was, I turned 33 right after the trial that summer of 95. And so, um, I'd gotten elected, uh, I, so I had York and Union, which was the 16th Circuit, and um, my joke was always they they had the worst backlog in the state, and I ended up running um, um, really kind of to clean the backlog up, and and you know with my relationship, I was a police officer, my relationship with law enforcement, and being young and energetic, you know, and. My joke was that I didn't know if they saw true merit in me or thought, heck, he can't do any worse than the other guy. We got the worst backlog in the state. So, you know, <laughs> I'm 30 years old. I get elected. Where I tried my first death penalty case. Let's see, I got sworn in in January and tried my first death penalty case in April. And um, it was funny. I was trying to clean up the backlog. So literally you were offering, you know, pleas to just get a little piece of justice out of so many different cases, you know, just get a little something. And, you know, the defense attorneys were actually benefiting from having that backlog, you know, and so, so they had no interest in cleaning it up. And I remember some offers that, you know, today I would never, you know, well, I'm not solicitor now, but you know what I mean? I would never think later on, once I got the backlog cleaned up, you know, the case, you know, the market would bear three times the penalty for what I was offering. But I remember this, like this first case I tried, literally, I think I had offered them a manslaughter and it wasn't a manslaughter. It was just, you're trying to get, the guy had been in jail. He um, had, it was the first DNA evidence case we had. He had uh, brutally assaulted a, a 80 year old woman and, and sexually assaulted her and beat her to death. Um, so it wasn't like I thought that's what it was worth, but we're trying to clean it up. Well, they, I remember the defense attorneys laughing at me and we went to trial and not only did we get him convicted, he got the death penalty. It was amazing. Next week, people started wanting to take my plea offers. So, <laughs> like so, maybe you know, that, he's that, on that, to something. <laughs> yeah, you know, maybe, maybe that we should have took the offer from last week. But um, so we were focused, you know, I'd build a good team. We were focused on, um, cleaning up the the backlog. And so, you know, kind of rocking along. Union's my small county, you know, only had court like once a week there. York County was my bigger county. And um, I remember, let's see, the week when, when it would have been around Halloween of 94, when the, um, the report that, you know, Susan Smith had been carjacked and, you know, Susan explaining that. I was actually in trial in York County I always said I was doing the Lord's work. I was prosecuting the preacher who had been embezzling from the daycare. <laughs> so, you know, I was doing the heavy lifting, you know, <laughs> over York County. And, you know, I, I had the sled agents, you know, that's our state law enforcement division. They would call me every night. And I was a former sled agent and they would kind of update me. So the other thing I always explain to people in the context back then, you know, it was, it was before our, you know, cell phone and, and social media and all that stuff. I mean, O.J. Simpson was going on. That was the first big kind of court TV kind of thing going on. And so Susan Smith comes along. And so 
and I just spoke to a high school group the other day, and they just can't fathom what a big deal it was. You know, the media trucks coming to Union, and you know, just so that's going on. But you really think, I mean, one, you know, they're searching this country for this African American, you know, that has carjacked these kids. Personally, I didn't really based on my law enforcement experience, a carjacker in the hierarchy of needs, there's a reason they call them a carjacker, not a kid jacker, you know, because right. they're, they're normally looking for the car, then some money, then maybe the adult female, you know, a carjacker isn't going to take kids normally. So in my mind, I mean, not that you weren't concerned about the disappearance of the kids, but in my heart of hearts, I thought it would work out it was probably some kind of domestic, you know, she and her husband were separated, kind of, you know, having difficulties. And so I really thought, you know, ultimately you'd find out she'd hid the kids with her, you know, cousin down at the beach or something, you know, kind of to get the, the drama going. So uh, we had just finished that trial and the um, sled agent called me that night and said that she had admitted that she'd rolled them in the lake. And so I loaded up and headed down to Union that night and was there when the boys were pulled out of the lake. Yeah, I've been to the lake and the memorial, uh, and it's it's heartbreaking. I mean, it's still there's still flowers there. Um, it's very very quiet, very peaceful. Um, but I mean, her confession. I remember. I mean, I remember the story vividly, and her confession kind of changed everything how did that impact your approach as a prosecutor so i'll tell you into this, it? Is, this is probably you know kind of the thirty thousand foot view so when i you know took on the case you know i, I sought the death penalty and and uh, as an aside i always i credit the defense but i you know in my mind I consider Smith an unsuccessful prosecution for me because I was, you know, seeking the ultimate punishment. And, you know, people, you know, same thing now, but it's on steroids. You know, people say, oh, he's doing that for attention or he's doing that for this or he's doing that for that. And, uh, but I really felt that had there been the African-American carjacker, there would have been an outrage if I did not seek the death penalty. If there had been David Smith, the father, had taken the lives of the children, the same would have occurred. And so even knowing that in South Carolina, we rarely gave the death penalty to females, I just felt that whatever um, the, the maximum penalty was, I felt that she deserved that. Um, and I always tried to explain to people, too, you know, you had David Bruck and Judy Clark on the other side, and they are tremendous anti-death penalty advocates. I always, and they want to to avert, you know, avoid the death penalty at all costs. They don't really care as much about guilt and innocence or anything else. They're just, they're, that's their mission. And I, I respect that. I'm not the yin to that yang. You know, I, I didn't wake up every day, you know, bloodthirsty and can't wait to execute somebody. You know, it was really more, I always viewed my role as the prosecutor more like um, uh, someone in the military. You know, I was willing to do what was required of me, but it didn't mean I, I relished it, you know, because, I mean, I'm I'm human and, you know, I, I believe in, you know, my Christian beliefs of forgiveness and compassion and all that are still there, but I I had a job to do. So short version, um, I always felt like one thing that unfolded that I thought was, was unfortunate is that Susan Smith being a white female that remind us of our sister or our co-worker or um, our paralegal here, here at the law firm, whatever, it, it, it was unsettling on, on many different levels. And I think law enforcement, to a certain extent, at least some in law enforcement, you know, beginning with the sheriff, who was actually her godfather, he, he was had a relationship, you know, with that family. Um, they didn't treat it quite the same, ultimately, you know, when you, you, you know, reference the confession as they um, would have if it had been another, a different defendant. And, and what I mean by that, the quote confession, you know, I had people go, why are you having to try the case? She confessed. Well, one, she, she admitted that she'd been lying about the, the, the African-American carjacker, you know, after 
I mean, ironically, the, the pervading feeling after worried about those kids was betrayal, you know, in the community because people are out searching, people are reporting all over the country, you know, seeing. But it um, ultimately, like the sheriff, the, the com quote confession, I got down to Union and I, was, I went over to where they had, had been talking to her and I said, um, could I see the statement? And they said, um, oh, we don't have anything in writing. They said, um, she's much too upset for that. And I said, look, guys, I mean, because I, I knew, I mean, one, I tried plenty of murder cases anyway, but I knew this one was going to transcend, you know, because of the media thing. It was going to transcend what you're doing. I said, I, I need something in writing. It was always disappointing to me that um, instead of, uh, and, and don't get me wrong, she could have clammed up. She could have said, I need an attorney. She could have done whatever she wanted. But they give her a legal pad and say, tell us how you were feeling. So her quote confession reads, and, and unfortunately I've recounted so many times over 30 years, you know, it was the worst day of my life. Somebody I loved did not love me. I sunk to my lowest when I let the boys go down the ramp without me. Um, well, the good news is it, it, it connects that it wasn't the black guy, you know, and, and that she was involved. But the bad news is there were so many questions left unanswered. You know, if you were confessing now, and you had told me you shot JR, I'd be going, okay, and then what'd you do? And then what'd you do? And then where did you get the gun? And then, but even when we went back to testing, testing the vehicle, the best we can determine is she literally got out of the car and then let the emergency break, you know, reached in and let the emergency break down. So, um, you know, there was a claim of a botched suicide, but to me, a botched suicide is I'm rolling down the ramp and suddenly realize you know, I can't do this. And I slam on brakes and I get us all out or back right. us up or whatever. She wasn't wet when she showed up to the house. So um, there was uh, some concern from the, like you said, the, the confession that she was treated a little different. And then when we got to the courtroom and I'm putting up what would normally be my witnesses, like the sheriff, it's tough when they're favorable to the other side kind of from the beginning, you know, they didn't want me to seek the death penalty. David right. Smith was the one that stood by me in that regard. Yeah. And Union, I mean, I, I, probably a lot of people have not been to Union. It is it is a small community. It reminds me a lot of Hampton, where the Murdoch right. you know, right. saga is. And everybody knows everybody. Everybody is related to everybody. It's, it's a very small, very tight community. So it is hard to investigate and prosecute a crime when everybody is you know I think so. and I think that it was probably some of the greater wisdom of the defense in keeping the venue there mm -hmm. you know uh, our venue rules are are, are pretty much that you, you have to attempt to find a jury and if you can't then you can you know go elsewhere and again uh, prior prior to that I had tried I mean the first death penalty case you and I were talking about before we came on um I had uh, the jury came like out of Greenwood. You know, they tried to find a demographic similar to York and 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 brought the jury from Greenwood. So there was some precedent for that. The difficulty for that too, as an elected prosecutor, I am forced to say that the people I represent cannot be fair and impartial. So that's a little bit of a tricky one. And so um and so I mean we seated the jury, and the truth was I even had the chief of police's uh wife was on the jury and um and you know again it wasn't that you know definitely here is a two-part trial it's uh the first it's bifurcated so the first part's just about guilt which mm -hmm. keeps out a lot of it uh evidence like of the true nature of the crime the nature of the defendant because it's can you prove they did it or not and then the second phase goes into the victim impact and all that stuff and so ultimately that jury i truly believe um did a vote that probably transcended the appropriate punishment for Susan and went more to what is the best way for that community to heal? Because if you can imagine, like you said, the little small town inundated, you know, again, I don't know if nowadays with the technology, I don't know if, if Hampton, you know, County or, you know, was better or worse, you know, with the media onslaught, but, um, you know, like I said, back in the old days, they had to drive full-size media trucks, you know, right. with generators and satellites on top and all that stuff. But 
I think the jury at some measure, and I, I, you know, certainly not speaking for them, but in observing it, I think they felt that uh, giving life probably gave some closure. Plus, I'm going to see Susan's mom and dad at the grocery store and all that stuff. And so, you know, and, and be, you know, those 12, 12 jurors carried a heavy burden too. Yeah. And it was, you know, emotionally a difficult case. Absolutely. The defense way, I mean, the the defense, a lot of their strategy was towards Susan Smith's mental health and that this was a botched suicide. So, you know, they were definitely weighing on the emotions of, of the people rendering that verdict, which I thought was interesting. Yeah, there was no doubt of. And again, I probably, uh, you know, I was a young prosecutor, so I, there were things that that, that I probably, I, I really look back and say, I don't know anything I would have done different in the trial, but I do, to the defense's credit, rightfully or wrongfully, the narrative, I, we were probably really could have tried the case in January, you know, that it happened in October, I mean, um, but um, and truthfully, with all the media attention, I would have tried it you know, as quick as I could just to be right done with it and move on because uh, they didn't quit arresting people on all our other cases, you know, while this was happening. But, you know, I tried it in July. Well, uh, the defense spent that kind of that spring into summer um, really working what I call work in the jury pool, the public opinion. It went from Susan the monster to Susan the victim, you know, victim of the stepdad, victim of the husband, victim of the boyfriend. Um, and and again, I, I respect that. Um the, the Susan I got to see, I'm not sure that that was accurate. Um, I've kind of become a lay psychologist a little bit over the years from just, you know, talking about it all. But um, I think from a jury standpoint or, or just a citizen standpoint, um, a mother killing their children, you know, you were talking about having your own children and that kind of impacts you more, is probably the most unsettling it could possibly be because there's things we can do. We can lock our doors and try to protect ourselves from the boogeyman, you know, the bad guy. Um, we even feel like there's some protection, you know, dad doesn't seem to be as much a threat for whatever reason, because mama, mama will kill you. You try to mess with her babies. You know what I mean? So, right. so, but there's something unsettling again, and it meshes with what I was telling you earlier when it makes us uncomfortable when suddenly the bad guy can be, you know, the, the, you know, the Jen Wood that I just met, you know what I mean? That, you right. know, you're not going to be that, you know, and then to, to go further every day I was going to the courthouse, my kids were home with my wife. I have to be able to feel comfortable I can leave them. So the best way to do that, to make sure my secretary doesn't do that, my wife doesn't do that, is if you can assign mental illness, then that explains why it's not going to happen to me. Right. The, the difficulty with that is um, there's no doubt anybody that commits any of the crimes, for the most part, in the courtroom, particularly the you know the homicide-related crimes, something's not meshing up. You know whether it's you got anger issues or you got whatever. I, I respect that, but I think she was not one. She wasn't disconnected, like from an insanity standpoint, because. Um, you know, in South Carolina, it's McNaughton. You have to know legal and moral right from legal and moral wrong, which, in fairness, is not a heavy burden. And, you know, see, if you could leave and come up and make up a story about a black guy carjacking, you put some thought into it. It's not like you were so delusional that you thought your kids need to be sacrificed to God or something like that, you know. And then um, so there's there's that aspect of her and then she actually there's so many little kind of side stories and i don't know how deep you want to get into it but she was writing to, to go take the polygraph because it's not unusual they always look at family members first you know that family shouldn't be offended. you know they looked at david smith they looked at her they're taking her to get a polygraph they're riding i remember one of the sled agents telling me she's flirting with it the kids are in the lake she's working this you know black guy carjacked me and um and she's flirting with one of the sled agents saying, um, this would be, uh, uh, it sure is beautiful. I wish you and I were just going to the beach. I mean, she was, 
she was she was flirting. I, I can't remember if it's histrionic, which was it's one of the DSM diagnoses that um, you know, you're either the princess or the victim. Right. And so going back to my lay psychology part, I said, um, you know, she had this letter from Tom Finley that said, you know, it was kind of a dear Jane letter, dear John letter, whatever, that um, you know, he'd had his fun with her, but you know, they weren't gonna be together. And she was all in love. He was gonna be the, you know, the prince that was gonna take her away. And um I think and he said, you know, you know, I'm really just not ready for children. Well, that was the coward's way of saying, you know, it's been real, you know, friends with benefits, you know, but we're moving right. on. You know? This is getting too serious for me. Right, right. I'm I've had my fun. I'm I'm moving on. So he um I think she really believed that if she didn't have those kids, um, that that she had an opportunity with him. I mean, she literally was wearing his Auburn sweatshirt the night she shows up at the house, the night she killed the kids, you know, when she claimed the carjacker there, and she's wearing Tom Finley's sweatshirt. She told David Smith, you know, where they're having almost like a vigil at the house, you know, where they're waiting to hear what law enforcement could tell them when they're looking for the car that Tom's probably going to want to come by. Um, actually, the raw footage I have of the first statement she gave, it was WSPA out of Spartanburg, um, and it's she and David Smith, and they called him to the house. That's the house she ran to right there at the entrance to the lake. Um, and, and the camera lady, the anchor person is saying, um, all right, so what we're going to do, you know, well, I'm going to ask you your name and everything. You know how they say, right, before right. they turn on the camera. And right before the light comes on, she looks at David and kind of giggles like, we're going to be on TV. And, of course, David's like this, you know, like deer in the headlights, you know. And um, and she rolls through her story about how being a carjacker. She enjoyed that attention. Again, not saying that's not mental illness too, you know, or again, whether it's histrionic or whatever, narcissistic, whatever, but um, she, she was focused on what was best for her. Best I recall her wedding album and wedding gown were in the back of that car too. Um, so everything but David Smith that would have, would have taken her marriage away from her and given her Tom was kind of bottled up in one thing. And, um, I put some thought back to my lay psychology degree I have now is uh, if somebody said, well, I would have taken those children. Why didn't she just give those children away? Okay. So work with me here. If you give the children away, you're a bad mother and you're less valuable to Tom Finley or your, your prince or whatever. But if the black guy takes your kids, you're a victim and you're more in need of rescue and, and more likely to, to, you know, be consoled by him, to be taken care of by him. Um, and then when we were in the courtroom, we had a video where ultimately we had recovered the car. They had actually dived during the week because the lake was in close proximity. The divers had looked for the car. We didn't know it till later. We tested it. We literally kind of created a testing procedure. We talked to some folks in... Um, um, Michigan State Police back then that had done some car flotation characteristics. And so we really, with SLED and other experts, tested the vehicle because we wanted to understand, you know, the media kind of tried to play it like a reenactment. We we didn't put little mannequins in the car or anything, but we were really trying to understand how long it floated, what was her opportunity if it was a botched suicide to change her mind. That car floated for six minutes, but what we found out it goes straight down that ramp. You've been, you would have thought, and I think probably maybe when you went, they, you know, they even moved that ramp because subsequently, you know, another group of another, people went yeah. out there to see it. That's, that's horrendous. But you would have thought it would just go straight in, but it actually floated and, and turtled. They call it kind of made a J and ended up over there to the right near the dam instead of where you would think it would be. Um, but anyway, they, they recovered that, but it, it, it told us, that there was about six minutes before the car fully submerged. Well, one, if she was suicidal and changed her mind, she'd been wet at a minimum. And I'm not saying, you know, you see all things on TV, I, the vacuum pressure keeps you from opening the door and all that stuff. I'm not saying she could have couldn't, but she could have tried. 
and she would she'd be at the house telling them I I I made a mistake and you'd have been she'd probably never been prosecuted you know what I mean it'd been a some strange tragedy you know but but um, so we're in the courtroom and we were putting this video into evidence and this is how old school we were we had those big TVs, the big cathode TV. You roll like them in on the cart. On the cart and everything. Well, you got it turned uh, toward the jury's out. You got it turned to, I'm sitting here and Susan's sitting over there and uh, we're playing it. And it is about six minutes of video. And probably, um, if you're interested sometime, I can probably dig up a copy of it if you'd like to see it sometime. I would but love to. Literally, it, it feels like it's sucking the oxygen out of the room when you watch it. Because you know, because the way the camera's placed, um, you know, this is where the kids were in the car seats. Now, granted, it was at night when when she killed them, but but um, so the car goes and kind of turns, and then it noses down, and suddenly you see the water come up through the floorboard and the vents, and just slowly till it covers the camera, and you know that's what happened to those boys. And I mean, just watching it, it is just distressing. I mean, even talk about it for me now is still distressing. You know, so we're in the courtroom, and I hear something over there. And I look, and she's playing tic-tac-toe or something with the law clerk and giggling, and she'll look, and she's giggling and laughing, and, you know, like she's just having a lark. We get it admitted, the jury comes in, we turn the camera, now you're watching the jury, and you're watching the horror on their face for the thing I just described as they're watching it, and suddenly you hear noise over here. You know what I hear over here this time? She's crying. And she wasn't crying. Now, I can't tell the jury that, you know, right. she wasn't crying a minute ago when y'all weren't in here. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, but now she, yeah, yeah, it's time to cry. You know what I mean? You know, and, and so that, you know, again, I've never spoken to her in my life, but little things like that told me um, all I needed to know about, you know, her character. Again, we're all products of our mom and daddy and environment and everything. I'm not saying what made her that way. It's just, um, unfortunately, she she's a victim of herself. I don't think a, a victim of others, you know. Right. A lot of people have difficult upbringings and right. manage to get I, through life without committing murder. Back then, it was, you know, it was letters. You know, people would send me. I got letters from all over the country. Basically, you know, I was abused. I was this. I was that. And my children are the most precious thing in my life. You know, so. Yeah. As a mom, when I was reading about that six minutes that it took the car to sink, it you know, it made me think of the time I, my son got lost at the zoo and it must have been 30 seconds, but it felt like an eternity. It just, it, that six minutes made my stomach oh, turn God, into I can't we, we had the grocery store episode and I, he's on one end of the aisle and I'm on the other and I keep looking and he must be going the other way and I can't ever find him. And I mean, that was, you know, and I'm panicking and same deal. Mine was maybe 30 seconds, you know, I don't know, you know, but it seemed like, it seemed like an eternity, but you're right. It was funny too, as a parent back then, I was thinking, and I mean, it's, you know, some of these things are so mundane, but um, I remember, you know, my kids and the car seats, and, you know, you had one set of car seats and what a pain it was to take out of my car and put in your car and, you know, I wish her seatbelt, you know, nowadays they got the clamps. Yeah, you click them they, 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 You know, and I'm running it through and that's all that. I, I was just thinking of all the strain to make these guys safe and then the irony to see those two little boys pulled out of the lake in those car seats. I know that sounds melodramatic, but I just thought it was, you know, it was a strange irony. The very thing we bust our cans to trying to protect them in was the ultimately, you know, part of the implement of their death. Yeah, yeah, it's it's... Yeah, it's yeah, that that was something that when did you play that during the guilty phase of the trial or the death penalty phase? The penalty, the penalty okay. phase. Okay, so like I, I alluded to earlier, and um, if I'm repeating stuff, I apologize, but the um, penalty phase is you have some one aspect is called um, pain testimony. It, it's ironic, it's P A Y N E, but it's really the pain, the impact of on right. the family. Another thing goes in is the nature of the crime vis-a-vis, -vis, and again, I kind of used it for two things, because I, I, so I'm kind of showing her character, because it, it all got out of sorts, like I said, from the beginning, the sheriff, their whole goal was to win it in penalty, so the sheriff is 
not even answering questions I'm asking, you know, I'm saying, and then, and then, you know, trying to get investigation. She goes, Susan was so upset or what, well, that's not what I asked you, but it's my witness. You know, how do you undo right. that? How do you... So, so, so they had already planted the, you know, poor Susan seed one before we ever got a jury, but two in the, in the guilt phase. And so, I mean, but the jury came back and found her guilty. And it's, you, you darned if you do, darned if you don't. You know, everybody said, you got a confession. I wasn't very hard or whatever. And David Brock came up to me during the trial. And he said, you know, because uh, I they, people laugh. I'm old school. I'm famous for my trial notebooks. You know, I'll come in there with 100 because I want a piece of paper. I don't want to worry that. It, well, back then, you didn't even have half the, you know, I probably the computer had been bigger than the notebook back <laughs> the then. The table. <laughs> But, uh, but, you know, I always had these notebooks and David Ruck said, well, you know, kind of tongue in cheek, he said, we pretty much abandoned the, the black guy did it defense. And I'm going, well, just in case you hadn't, that's what this notebook's about. You know, I, you know, kind of prepared for each one of them. But, you know, so really what I was using it in the penalty phase were, were two things. One, I, well, even before the trial, I just wanted to know how long it took the car to sink because if you're telling me botched suicide and that car went straight down like a rock as soon as it went in the lake, I'm at least a little more amenable to what you're telling me. Um, number two, though, knowing the whole deal, and I can't even remember without going back and looking at her statement, you know, maybe she said something about letting the hand break down, but there wasn't the the step-by-step -step detail, like I said, that you would expect if you were interrogating, if I committed the crime and you'd say, then what'd you do? Then what'd you do? Did you do it with your left hand or your right? Did you do this? But somehow we knew the break was down. But my whole point is that was such an intentional act versus, because I even played through my mind, okay, she's committed suicide, she's freaked out, she's nervous, then she changed her mind, she can't do it, she doesn't want to kill herself. She bails out of the car. Well, then her clothes had been torn and she'd been skinned up, you know, going down that ramp. There was some, there was none of that. And so, again, almost filling in the blanks backwards. So, one, that thing told me it sank six minutes. It didn't mean, as I said earlier, that she could have automatically rescued her, but it sank. I mean, it floated a while like this when I think there's a heck of a good chance, you know, before you get the pressure on the doors, that if you changed your mind, I guarantee you I'd have been in the car. If it was yeah. my kids, you know what I mean? Even if I'd had, you know, whatever brought me to do it, I'd have been in the car if I'd come to my senses and done it. Um, so that was in the penalty phase. And then also, to a certain extent, it showed the nature of the death. You know, when I said that, the, I mean, the horror of how those children would have died. And it's funny, if you go back in her statements or what she says I mean, even that first statement on video, she's talking about, um, you know, when the black guy says, uh, she said, well, let me get my babies out of the car. And he said, no, I don't have time for that. And she said, and they were just crying. I bet they were, but they're crying because mama's got out and left them. I, I bet she heard them crying. You know, I didn't say this jury because I can't do, I bet. Yeah, you know, I, mean? I can't I think speculate. Probably. You know? Right. Right. But I can't imagine you wouldn't hear those kids crying for six minutes. I mean, just from being scared and in the dark, because the jolt when it first hit the water had to be something, you know, but so ironically, when you see her statements or, you know, watch the videos, different things she said, it, like most good lies, it's probably laced with enough truth. She really, you know, when she's closing her eyes thinking, I don't think she's, she's closing her eyes and reliving. Right, right. Yeah, shit. Yeah, that if I that six minutes, it still gets me. Yeah, my chest did, is tight now. I'm all jacked up. Now. I know. Yeah. Did um, I mean, so she, so she received two life sentences, not the death penalty. I think that's correct. Yeah, yeah. and she is up for parole after almost thirty years. Thirty years. So in 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 nineteen ninety six, the law changed in life became life and it really meant life right um at that point um life did not mean life and the case law was such you could not tell the jury because parole eligibility was speculative in other words she's eligible now maybe she gets out this year maybe she doesn't so so the law in its wisdom had decided you the judge had to instruct them you're to take life in its plain and usual meaning and it seems as best I recall, there was um, 
you know, jurors that spoke maybe after the fact that said um, that, um, you know, they just felt like that her being in prison, you know, reflecting on what she had done, you know, was was a better punishment. And again, we talked earlier about, I think they probably did the community a favor. You know, there were so many layers to that. But for the ones that believe that, I mean, that's kind of my argument for uh, continued incarceration. One, I think she's clearly exhibited. She's thinking about Susan, you know, with the relations with the guards yeah. and all the different stuff. Um, you know, right now she's got, you know, supposedly several guys that want to marry her when she gets out. And, you know, there's somebody for everybody out there, apparently. You know, Live but, for every pot. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. You know, but, um, but, uh, so I think her conduct, at least to the extent that the jurors' wishes were for her to, I think her remorse is for Susan, not for Michael and Alex. Yeah, I mean, looking at her her SCDC records, you know, the programs that she's taking, you know, the, the betterment programs that they right. offer, those didn't start until 2015. So 20 years into her incarceration yeah. As it's kind of time to get ready. Yeah. Right. Maybe I better yeah. do something to make myself look good. Do yeah. you get to speak at the parole hearing as you the know, or... Ironically, over all these years, I don't think I have ever gone to a parole hearing. Um, I normally, back when I was the solicitor, and I think Kevin Brackett, uh, my my deputy who tried, uh, was you know on the case with me, and um, I think he goes to some, but... Normally, I've had some standardized letter that was some variation of, I believe in truth and sentencing. That's kind of mm -hmm. the way I, and that, you know, the jury gave life. They believed it to be life. That's what it ought to be. Um, if I'm needed this time, you know, it's a tough balance because, again, I try to be fair in my prosecution and not be vindictive. Right. Um, by the same token, um, you know, one thing we hadn't really talked much about was David Smith, the father. Um, so when I go down to Union the first day, and again, stop me if I'm repeating any of this stuff. I've, I've been telling it for 30 years. So yeah. I, you know what I mean? If I tell you something twice, I apologize. Um, I told the sheriff, I said, I need to go meet with the, the family. I want to just introduce, you know, so they'll know I'll be handling the case. Because I always explain it's the state versus Susan Smith, not the victims. But I want to keep their their interest in mind. Well, so sheriff takes me to this house. And the first person I see is Bev Russell, who was the stepfather of Susan Smith, the one that allegedly molested her. And I had known him. He was involved, like, in the Republican Party. I ran in a uh, Republican for solicitor in 92 when, you know, all the Republicans met in a phone booth, you know, or what, right. you know, back then. And so I, I knew him, and I said, well, you know, what are you doing here? I thought it was almost like a funeral visitation. I thought he had just stopped to see the family. And he said, no, I'm Susan's stepfather. And it suddenly dawned on me, the sheriff had taken me to Susan's parents' house. You know, and I'm the guy that's going to seek death against your daughter, and who I was looking for was David Smith. Well, they didn't think much of David. So, you know, he wasn't there. But I, I just, I mean, that, that's where I really realized how, you know, off the deep end the sheriff was in, in her camp. But he he took me there. And and, and so, you know, I kind of tap danced through that, introduced myself. It was just extremely awkward. You know, her brother, her mother, you know, and, and you know, I'm basically the bad guy in this scenario. Right. You're not going to blame your daughter, you know. And so... So then I, I finally get him in David Smith, of course, instead of being in the fancy neighborhood union, lived in a little apartment somewhere. And 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 I, I told the sheriff, I, I want to talk to the father. So he took, sheriff didn't even get out and go in. He just sat in the car and sent me and he said, He's, you know, it's the top apartment up there. Mm -hmm. And I went and David was there by himself and he was just, he was just devastated. And I mean, again, I take it all the way back to that first video when if somebody told me somebody had just got my kids and then the double whammy, you know, he th for what, nine days, he thinks his kids are carjacked and then he finds out his wife did it. Right. And, you know, I mean, it's I don't even know, you know, how he kept it together. And so he and I became close on, on my journey, you know, because, again, I, I felt like whatever the at the maximum punishment was 15 years in South Carolina for that homicide that she needed the maximum, whatever it was, you know, again, to break it a little bit from pro or con on death penalty per se, whatever the maximum she needed. But he, he stayed with me during that entire thing and and was supportive 
And I, I remember that uh, there came a point where they were deciding whether cameras would be in the courtroom or not. And by the time we got ready to try it in July, it had turned from Susan the monster to why, why am I prosecuting, you know, poor Susan? Well, they didn't get to see David Smith and what I knew all the time, and I couldn't ethically talk about it. And so I remember when it came down to cameras in the courtroom, I thought, um, I'm kind of darn if I do, darn if I don't. Because yeah. if I say I want cameras, I'm a glory hound. If I don't want cameras, I got something to hide. But I always tell people that when David Smith testified that I wish there were cameras in the courtroom then, because anybody that wondered why I was doing what I was doing in that case, and this is selfish on my part, if they had heard him testify, they would know. Because in a death penalty case, the, 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 the tact I normally take is basically... I bring, bring your loved one back to life. In other words, I brought those two boys back to life and talked about the good times and the swing sets and the sliding boards and not wanting to take a bath. We always thought that was an irony. You know, the boys hated the tub, you know, which was <laughs> kind of sad and tragic. Yeah. And that I think it was uh, um, Michael that he couldn't say 101 Dal Dalmatians. He would say 101 Diametrons. And so... And so, you know, and what happened is, David, the way I'd always do it is like, you know, if you were telling me about your kids, you know, and I just would kind of casually do it. We didn't overdo it. You didn't rehearse it. And I would just, but I would prepare you. I said, so basically, I'm a, I want to talk about the good things. I want to honor their memory and talk about them. And then I'm going to bring you to, you know, the facts and what you heard and then kind of come out the end. And, and rarely would we rehearse it. But anyway, so I do that. And so basically what I'm doing is bring your loved ones back to life and then taking their lives again, you know, because you're taking them to the point. You remember the night you got the phone call and you remember this. It was just excruciating. I was about to burst into tears and I'm not allowed to do that. And um, by the time he got through, I don't know if there was a dry in the courtroom, but um the defense was wise enough not to ask him a single question, you know, but, but going back to selfishly for me, if they had seen that pain and that anguish, they would know, nobody would doubt, you know, that it really wasn't about, he brought it back to Michael and Alex and the pain, not about poor Susan, you know, and so it was, it, it was a tough one. Yeah, that's, and I met, I mean, I imagine he's, part of that process when it comes to parole i would i would believe somebody you know folks over the years have always asked me and i've talked to him from time to time um um but i always think it's like say and god bless it happened but if i ever you know as a prosecutor and you had something you're my victim i am always happy to hear from you and always welcome to hear from you but i never reach out to you right because i represent such a horrible time in your life that that I don't want to invade your healing process. You know, and I mean, I know it's been 30 years and I, I imagine that that when I see David, you know, if he's there, we'll have a good reunion, but I never reach out to him. He's, he, I think he's got two, which I'm, I'm assuming will be grown daughters now himself, you know? So, yeah. you know, luckily he, you can't say happily after after, but I mean, he was able to move on and have a life, which is, is something. I think it's interesting. I mean, I got, I, I said I had stories back then enough to fill National Enquirer. <laughs> you know, we had weird stuff come. There was a, when David, this was the one I was going to tell you, David Ruck comes to my office in York, and I had a bunch of these old, like, English sketches of barristers in the courtroom, and they're bolted, I say bolted on the wall. You know, they're hanging somehow, but it was like with some screws, not just your little hook or whatever. David Ruck comes in, and one of them falls off the wall. And, you know, after he leaves in my lobby, you know, in the solicitor's office, and I um, pick it up, and I can't remember what is this, like, this, it was something like the barrister defending this woman, it's a pencil sketch, you know, or whatever, and it said something like this, this poor widow, this honest woman or something. And I was going, Bo, I got one even for National Enquirer. You know, what are the odds? You know, <laughs> what are the odds? This you picture know, that, that falls. one falls off the wall of all, you know, like a, the hate, you know, the ghost got it though. But, um, but um, David, 
came to me during the, the trial. He had somehow, you know, because victims asked me, do I need an attorney? And I said, look, I don't represent you, but I represent, I think your interests are aligned, you know, but if you need an attorney, because you, know, you had all the media stuff and people get, he didn't know what to do. And I would tell him, but I would also tell him, you know, I can't, you got to decide. But anyway, somehow he ended up with a lawyer and there was a publisher and they convinced him that it would be good for him to write a book to kind of just put everything down and get it off his chest kind of deal. And he asked me what I thought. And I said, David, really, whatever's best for your healing is, you know, unfortunately I've dealt with more cases like this than I want to say, or, you know, death at least. But I said, whatever's best for you, um, you know, that's what you need to do. And so I said, the one thing I'd say is if, if they do write a book, if you, you think that helps, and, and I could see it'd be almost like therapy, you know, kind of like me talking to you, if I just dump it all out and get it out, you know? Right. And so he said, um, um, I said, the one thing I do is just tell them you not to publish it till we got through with the trial. So day one of the trial starts and the David Brooke, the defense walks in with a copy of the David Smith book. And David Smith, of course, was devastated because they had promised him it wouldn't be published. But, you know, from a publishing standpoint, what better day right. than the day of the trial? You know, so they they didn't give a crap about him. I was so angry. But anyway, he was just devastated. He literally went out on the courthouse steps and donated every penny from that book to children's charities. You know, he just had to do some, almost like, you know, getting baptized. You know, he had to do something for a catharsis to get washed of that taint. And uh, I always remember, because I thought, you know, he's a young guy working at the, in the meat manager at Winn-Dixie or whatever. He could have really used that money to, to move on and start a life. And, and he gave it all up. And I thought, I bet that lawyer and that defense attorney, I mean, that lawyer and the publisher, I bet they kept their third of the Yeah, money. they didn't donate it. Yeah, yeah. And it was, it, that was tragic, you know. But yeah. Anyway. All right. I told you talking to me is like getting a sip of water out of a fire. I like, no, I love, no, I love all the backstories. It's, yeah, no, this is, again, <laughs> I'm one of those people I like that stuff. <laughs> I can't thank Tommy enough for taking the time out of his busy schedule to speak with Fitz News about the Susan Smith case. We are grateful for his candid reflections on her trial and parole considerations. Stay tuned to Fitz News for more as Smith's parole hearing approaches in November of this year.